This Week in Science would like to thank AudibleKids.com for their support of this hour of science programming. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The unexamined life is not worth living, said Socrates in defense of his life lived in endless pursuit of examinings. So what of an unexamined universe? While many people find the unexamined universe worth living in, they are likely the same truck of folk that live in the un- living the unexamined life, never questioning, ever mindless of the vast intricacies in the oceanic abundance of the reality that surrounds. It is an illness of mental potential. If they ever stop for a moment to consider why it is that they don't examine themselves or the world around them, they would be cured of this mindless fate. While the following hour of programming does not necessarily represent the views of the University of California at Davis, KDVS, or its sponsors, it does attempt to keep you on the path of mindful pondering, endless examining, and tireless thinking. Together, we will pursue the life worth living with This Week in Science, coming up next. Good morning, Kirsten. <laughs> good morning, Justin. How's it going today? Going good. Very good. Had a great morning. Everything's terrific. <laughs> Where did you put Justin? <laughs> well, dang it. <laughs> What's going on I here? I got those emails that say, like, be less, you know, more professional-ish and right. less enthusiasticable. So Right. So you're today I'm going to try my anchor voice for the remainder of the show. Great. Give the people what they want. Sure. At least in small doses. <laughs> Well, look, I hope we continue to give people what they want. This is This Week in Science. We're going to be here for the better part of the next hour, talking all about the science stories from the last week. And we have an interview at 9 o'clock with Donald Prothero. He is a paleontologist, <laughs> not an opinionologist, as Justin. <laughs> I thought that's what it was. And I was very impressed. I said, no, paleontologist. I was like, an opinionatologist? Opinionatologist? That's what I, I could have been. I could be that. You could. That's a degree I could have. I, I, think, could I think we can give you a... Uh, <laughs> give you one of those those nice those nice degrees that universities I'm give totally out. totally getting that. Yeah. That's going to be my... I'll invent that one. Opinionatology. Opinionology. Nice. Anyway, Donald Prothero is a professor of geology at Occidental College in Los Angeles, and he's written a book called Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters. And this is pretty much to date the most complete text on the fossil evidence for evolution. So it's a, and and he starts the book out with a really, really great introduction. He goes from basically what is science? What is evolution? He starts answering these questions, talking about the the differences of opinion that people have between the scientific community and the general crazy. public. <laughs> <laughs> between the scientists and the crazies. Yeah, of the world. okay. All right. But uh, it's it's a fascinating, fascinating book. I uh, started reading it and I'm really enjoying it. And hopefully, we'll be able to get some good information out of Dr. Prothero today. Long held belief that women are more talkative than men is being challenged by a new study. Research published in the Personality and Social Psychology Review by SAGE Sage. A Gallup poll confirmed that men and women both actually believe that women are the, uh, the most talkative, that they're the ones that do all the chatting. Some even <laughs> believe that it's women who are bi- uh, have like biologically built-in conversation portions of the brain that just don't shut down. They haven't met you, have they? <laughs> 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 you talk more than I do. <laughs> Jeez. The article describes, well, the, the recent set of meta-analysis conducted by Campbell Leeper and Melanie Ayers. Uh, basically, it found that actually there's a small tendency for men to talk more than women, but it depends on the context. And overall, men talked a little bit more, but the context were different. Um, type of speech was explored so that they, women are generally more talkative when it comes to using speech to affirm connection to the listener. Uh, whereas men's speech is more focused to attempt to influence the listener. Friends and family conversations, there's very little difference between genders and the amount of speech. It's kind of interesting because I was 
I was up in uh, in the Tahoe uh, doing some sports betting this weekend. Wow. And, yeah, if you want to see a bunch of chatty Cathy's, <laughs> go to a sports bar where there's a room full of men trying to pick odds on the sporting game for the tomorrow's games. And it's just, blah, 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 he's got that defensive back. Blah, 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 blah. It's just like they're on they some talk. kind of talking yeah. drug. <laughs> so, yeah, like, if you, if you took a, you know, if conversation is about sports or... Um, something like that I could see that maybe guys are extremely talkative in comparison to women who probably don't talk much about sports. I would assume. I've never had a really lengthy I mean, sports it, conversation. It depends on the girl. Yeah. I, uh, in college, I had a really good friend who she loved football. She could talk yeah. about it forever. She knew all of the, wow. you know, she knew everybody. So you can't generalize that way. I mean, it's not, it, it is a stereotype that girls don't like sports as much as boys. Boys talk more than girls although as i was as i was preparing like reading that study last night in the cafe psychological impressions there was this girl sitting next to me on her cell phone the while on the computer doing chat on the computer and conversing over the phone at the same time (laughs) and i'm like oh my god that's that's the stereotype and then she went back to her studies of some sort of insane mathematics on the screen that i couldn't even comprehend so she was busting one, the girls don't like math thing because she was a math right. major while reinforcing that. Anyway, while reinforcing the other. So guys talk more, apparently, or at least I'm attempting to prove that by right now. <laughs> rambling on <laughs> incessantly. Oh, my goodness. What, do, what else do we have in common with monkeys? Well, researchers are figuring that out. It, there's a, uh, a principle of human behavior. Well, okay, <laughs> Justin, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? Huh? Too bad we don't have a camera in here. <laughs> Too bad. Uh, humans I'm in their behavior. Poo. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> in our behavior, we have this this tendency for self deception or a, a, a something that psychologists call cognitive dissonance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, basically, you rationalize irrational decisions. So if two things are of the exact same value and they're totally the same value, if you have to choose one of the two things, suddenly people decide that what they've chosen, they've made the best decision. Hmm. And so if they're given a choice again, they're more likely to pick the same same thing, yeah, Yeah, as opposed to going back and forth at a 50-50 basis. Um, This uh, this has been studied for a long time. 1956 was one of the the first actual studies of of the principle and uh, by a researcher at Yale. Recently, though, there was a study published in Psychological Science, again, at, ye- um, at Yale. Oh, wait, no, the first experiment wasn't at Yale. But anyway, this one's at Yale. I believe you. It's at Yale. Um, they looked at capuchin monkeys and four-year-old humans to see whether or not the same principle held up. The little kids, they gave them stickers to pick between, and the monkeys got M&Ms. Uh, so basically, they with the monkeys, they gave them three different M and M's and of three different colors, and the monkeys had to start picking them. And the monkeys chose these three colors on an equal basis. You know, there was no preference between, no preference for any one of the particular colors. So then they gave the monkeys a choice of two of the mm-hmm. colors of M and M's, and the monkeys would choose one. So if it was like red and blue, they'd pick red. And suddenly, every choice after that, the monkeys chose red. Hmm. On, or at least at a higher, they... a higher percentage of times, they chose red. So the monkeys, these animals that you know, supposedly, in social psychologists supposedly think that this cognitive dissonance is you know, some aspect of our higher, higher uh, cognitive abilities. And that this is something that only, you know, animals with a higher brain function and consciousness would be able to do, you know, trick themselves into believing something (laughs) irrational. But it turns out that these monkeys do the exact same thing. And the four-year-old children, again, with stickers, they did the exact same thing. Four-year-old children, when given a choice between things that are exactly the, are originally exactly the same, then start choosing choosing the one that they've chosen. And the idea for this is that basically the reason that you're that people do this is that it might be evolu- evolutionarily or monkeys also, you know, that this might be something that's held up evolutionarily in these social creatures because once you've made your decision, why go back and think about it again? Why waste time on it? 
Second guessing, guessing is a time waster, an energy waster, and it doesn't help you get anywhere any faster. Yeah, but how could St. Louis have won by that many points, Kirsten? This is, this is what I still don't <laughs> understand. I mean, how did they do it? I just don't. Oh, wait. I, no, I, I, I see yeah. what you mean. There's, there really isn't any point. Yeah. This article that was, uh, that was sent in by Ed Dyer from uh, IHT.com, this article is really interesting. It brings up uh, another experiment by a guy, a guy named Lieberman where he looked at people with amnesia versus normal people. And these people with amnesia had an impaired short-term memory, so they couldn't remember anything in the short term. So they should forget the mm -hmm. choices that they've made, right? And in fact, they did forget the choices that they made consciously. But when it came to actually going back and making another choice between the same two objects in which they had chosen one preferentially earlier, they tended to go back to that same object hmm. preferentially. So there's something that is at a like a, a lower level of the brainstem, or there's some kind of connection that's going that's being made. That's a pretty strong connection. Whereas normal mem the, the actual memory of making the choice is forgotten. There's something that's held over in the brain. Or the it's memory, really the memory would still have to be there. And it w what it would be curious then is then the it's the memory directing the choice even beyond our consciousness. Right. Which is kind of cool. Kind of cool. That means our subconscious is Once like, you trick uh, yourself, you're totally hoodwinked. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Never go back. Well, if you want your little monkey to achieve uh, even greater cognitive skills, teach them math. Yeah. Educational Do study it. finds that children who enter kindergarten with elementary mathematics uh, and reading skills are most likely to experience later academic success. They found that the most important factor was was how well they were prepared for the kindergarten. This actually, they this was more important than the social behavioral uh, mm -hmm. attitude and experience of the kid from then on. And this is like starting with five year olds going up to seven to fourteen year olds to track the some thirty five thousand preschoolers in the United States, Canada, and England. Wow. Paramount importance, early math skills. Beginning uh, school with knowledge of numbers, number order, and other ru rudimentary mathematics um, was the number one sort of uh, sign that the kid was going to do well. Now, this meant that actually this mastery of early math skills predicted not only a future math achievement, it also predicted future reading achievement. So the more your kids can sort of figure out numbers and the order of numbers and how that works, the more likely they're to pick up reading and be really good at that, too. The reverse, however, kids who were really good at reading going into kindergarten but had no math schools did not pick up the math skills like the math kids picked up the reading skills. Right. They didn't do quite as well. That's really interesting. I, I remember taking the... Uh anecdote time i just remember anecdote time <laughs> yeah anecdote time i just i remember you know taking the sat in high school and there was always you know the people it seemed like the people in my class who took the sat who uh they did really well in the the writing and english portion of the mm -hmm. sat usually they either they either ever the scores were either kind of even across the board or it was really good in the english side and not good in the math or it was really good in the math, but not good in the English. There, there are those people who well, are amazing at math, but I'm when it comes to I'm the reading, <laughs> yeah. I'm a mix. No, I would get 100% reading comprehension and like 40% on spelling. Like yeah. the spelling aspect of anything, I'm just done. I'm like, I can't, I can't tell you how many letters are even in a word. <laughs> I don't even know. But when I'm reading it, it's fine. It's like I can read, but I can't write. That's almost what it feels like. <laughs> it's that bad. Partial. Partial literacy. It's not a dyslexic <laughs> thing. I don't put. I don't write letters backwards. I just have. I'm trying to think of the word, and I, I don't know. Is it e before i except after w? Like, there's all these laws and rules. I just can't handle it, man. But comprehension, 100. percent Right. I've got a bunch of neuroscience news this week. There is bring the brain. Yeah, bring I've got me serious, the brain. serious brain news published this week in Science Magazine. Researchers have. Uh, they're from. Uh, let's see, where are they from? Science they are Magazine. State Beautiful. University of New York, so SUNY Stony Brook, and they have colleagues at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. These researchers have done a magnetic resonance scanning study of uh, the brain. They started with mice and rats um, and looked at the brain. The, the, so in mice, in humans, there's been this question for a really long time, what happens to neurogenesis or the birth of brain cells as 
you age. The idea, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, was that you were brain born with all the brain cells you were ever going to have, and they just died, and they off. Just died off. And that's you know? it. Yeah, and as we've gone through the last 30 years, research has given evidence that we act that's not actually true the many areas of the brain yes they kind of they 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 grow and then you prune them so basically like your 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 brain cells are growing when you're a baby and then during your adolescence there's pruning that's going on making all those connections marijuana what, what? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking pruning, about you mean loss of brain cells not loss of brain cells but pruning of the branches of the brain cells so like, hormones Marijuana and too much homework. No, just experience. Right. Just experience. Experience makes connections strong. Some connections stronger. Some connections weaker. Maybe the very weak connections die back. So that the the connections that are necessary for survival, for moving forward in life, are the ones that help that are, that stay connected in the brain. That's the kind of the idea. Um, but in some areas of the brain, like the hippocampus. Uh, which is related to memory and the formation of new memories. There's actually some kind of a turnover of brain cells, and so there are new brain cells that are born. Mm. Um, but the question has been, how can we actually see that? You you can't see it in an adult human. Or, I mean, in a, in mice, you have to chop their brain up to be able to see it. You know, you, you let so them grow to, to a certain age, and then you chop their brain up and you look at so it. We need to design a choppable brain when we can nope. rebuild and put back <laughs> right, a living that's human being. Okay. That's, and that's one way. And that's basically what they've done with huh? um, with with scanning technology. Oh. So um, to date, scanning technology has been really hard to use in humans because you have to inject some kind of a magnetic dye or some kind of particles, radioactive stuff, things that that react things that you to, don't want in your brain not necessarily one. exactly <laughs> <Right on. laughs> don't yeah. stick a needle in my head and put that stuff in there <laughs> exactly but researchers at uh so cold spring harbor suny stony brook brookhaven national laboratory they set up this scanning machine to look for the signals that are given off specifically by new cells. So they're, by looking at, at mice to begin with and comparing the brains of baby mice and adolescent mice to adult mice, they were able to find that there is a specific signal that's given off by what are called neural progenitor cells or the stem cells that are in the developing mouse brain and that turn out to be the same signals that are also in the young human brain. Hmm. So they did a mouse study, and they, then they took it to people, and they found that they could detect these neural progenitor cells, these brain stem cells, in young and adult brains. You know, there's less of them in adults because, you know, you're an adult and they're not producing as many brain cells anymore. But they're there. Extra. So it, this is... a, a an amazing advancement in technology and uh, they don't really understand what they're detecting they think they might be detecting like specific lipids fats that are um, being produced in these new cells but they don't really know what exactly they're detecting they just know it's a signal that's specific to these young cells hmm. uh, and the thing next that they're hoping they can use this technology for is discovering what's going on in degenerating brains of adults. So in adults who have Parkinson's or, um, you know, just any, any neurological disease in which the brain cells start deteriorating and dying off, maybe they can start finding out what's going on by doing this imaging stuff and catching the progress progression of diseases so we can learn more about what's going on in the brain. I mean, it's still not, they, the, the, the headlines for this have been like, scientists witness neurogenesis, and that's not accurate because they haven't actually witnessed neurogenesis, they're witnessing a signal in the brain. But and so there's a, coral, uh, it's a correlation, yeah, but it's, and, and that's, it, I'm just being, I know, I'm being scientifically I know. stringent at You're being stringent, point. but yeah. I, it's like. But it's the, cool, it's still cool. Like recently how they, they discovered some of those, uh, mm. some of those, uh, what do you call them? I think I actually have this story here somewhere. Yeah, high energy cosmic rays. Yeah. And they found out a way where they're just limiting the, the view of what they can, they're actually qualifying as the high, high energy stuff and where it's coming from. And they may actually be able to f observe where some giant black holes are in the universe that we can't see through any sort of light, through right. any other means. Because they suck light into them. <laughs> right. Well, or anything else magnified around it. But it's only a small group of high energy uh, cosmic rays 
that they're witnessing that are telling them the location of where these things might be, which is an observation. So maybe we are observing neurogenesis. It's Indirectly. Just, Indirectly, but what it, when we have to go well beyond our senses to take in this mm-hmm. universe. It's so big, it's so vast, it's so small, it's so vast, it's so everywhere. Yeah. We can't rely on eyes. No, we can't. I, we, math. Math. <laughs> it's math all is a good about thing. math. <laughs> math is really helpful in a lot of these things here. Hey. It, oh, 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 no, no, oh, go ahead. I got more. So there's also a couple of... Uh, I revised that earlier study, huh? Was that women don't talk more? Where did that go? Look over that real quick. Oh, um, so there's another study that's published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by researchers at the University of Washington. They have discovered the signal that keeps uh, stem cells from helping to regener- regenerate nerve cells in the spinal cord. Yeah, that's awesome. That's Well, yeah. that's weird, first of all, that you have stem cells in the spinal cord that when there's an injury, they leave the area. Yeah, there's, they bail. A, there's a signal. It's a, a, a protein called Netrin-1, N-E-T-R-I-N-1. Yeah. And, <laughs> and in the developing nervous system, it says, ooh, come here. And it Build. attracts Build. stem cells to come. And then it goes, no, oh, go away from here. Stop, or, stop. Exactly. But in the adult, when the, when the spinal cord gets severed or injured in some way, for some reason, it only says off. It says go away, it tells and them the to stem leave the cells area go away. The, leave the area of the injury, which anywhere yeah. else in your body, you have some sort of regenerative ability. Just Our about. skin. Or, There's other creatures yeah. that can actually rebuild their spinal cord because their stem cells will work there. Mm-hmm. Ours are like, it don't you're do done. It. You're We're not done. even going to try to help right. you. It's like it's an really ambulance <laughs> driving the opposite way. Like you, an ambulance <laughs> witnessed you get you know, injured on the side of the road, See ya. turns the siren on and drives away from you. That's basically what stem cells do in the spinal cord. <laughs> exactly. But they found that if they block the Netrin 1 signal, they were able to do this um, not in vivo, but in vitro. So they're in, in a dish. They're basically able to block Netrin 1, and they find that stem cells do migrate toward the injured site. So mm. maybe there's something to be said for this in the future of, you know, helping out people who have um, spinal cord injuries. Um, and the final one, there are two stories out this week, one from the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago and Northwestern uh, University, and another from a group of researchers at the Fraunhofer Institute for Computer Architecture and Software Technology, FIRST, and the Charité Hospital in Berlin. Um, the first one is uh, this guy, Todd Kuyken, Kuyken, who has created a technique called targeted muscle re Oh, yeah. This is good stuff. Yeah. His, his study published in the Journal of Neurophysiology by the American Physiological Society has shown that they're able to, what they do is they take nerves that originally used to direct towards, say, your hand. If your hand is chopped off, the nerves don't go there anymore, but they don't go away either. And the brain still, for a long time, actually thinks that it's sending signals to a hand. Mm -hmm. Took those nerves, kind of cut them, and then innervated a patch of muscle on the chest. So that the chest, that the brain thinks that your hand is now kind of on your chest. Reason it doesn't that, matter where If you've it got is, a prosthetic and one of the ways you can mm-hmm. control the prosthetic is like squeezing a pectoral muscle because the arm's not there. You can move the hand up or the hand down or clasp or unclasp. So if you, if you can trick your body into actually thinking that's where your hand is in that chest muscle to react that muscle, it makes it much more natural. That way it's like you're not trying to wiggle your toe to scratch your nose. It's right. more, it, it makes more sense to the brain, to you. You don't have to redo neural pathways they're yeah. already built there in the brain. They're designed to work that hand, and it becomes very natural action. Right, exactly. And so what they found, uh, so far, the people who, who have received this TMR technique, uh, they only have four movements, like open, close, and then move the hand up or down or whatever. So it's not a lot, not four a large. Four is pretty solid. This new study, they showed that by using um, a more sophisticated analysis with a larger number of um, a nerve uh, innervations, they were able to get the patients to, or they can identify uh, like 16 new movements. Wow. So for the elbow, wrist, hand, thumb, and finger, and they identified the movements with 95% accuracy. So now the next step is to actually, since they can identify the movements, actually be able to train up the uh, prosthesis to do what it's supposed to do. <laughs> you got to turn that off. I know. So, uh, 
That's that's really pretty awesome, intense, and it's still it's you can uh, part of the what helps train these things too is like those monkeys that were operating the prosthetic arm with just their mind powers. Mm-hmm. It's the ability for the brain to sort of redirect and rechannel um, the information that's coming in and out, so that if you've lost your arm, you can figure out a way for your mind to make a prosthetic arm move. It'll it'll take over those functions. It'll figure it out. Yeah. It's like it's tr- constantly trying to problem solve and figure out why it's not happening. Right. You know? There's a um, so the other study out of Ger- uh, Germany is this con- this project called Brain to Robot, and it's basically mm-hmm. relying on the electroencephalograph. Yeah, basically that's what it is. So it's a, a, a cap on your head, pretty much that reads the signals that your brain is giving off, and it's a chair that you sit in, pretty much that. Mm. If you're completely paralyzed, you can just think about stuff, and yeah. it'll it'll do it for you. It's it's pretty amazing that this robot has uh, been in development for over seven years. Uh, the, pa- the electrodes on the scalp measure the electrical signals, and then the uh, there's a self learning technique so that you do the signals and see what the computer does and learn how everything and your brain translates to this new extension of your body. It's just another like like the, like a car is an extension of your body now, and you can control it control it by using your hands and your feet, c- grabbing onto these levers and pedals and wheels. You know, wheels. Um, now it's just you don't have to touch anything, but your brain still extends itself to this new extension in much the same way. And uh, hopefully they've got some they've got some grant money, and hopefully they'll be ready to commercialize it in just a few years. It's going to be fascinating. I wonder fascinating. how many. I wonder how <laughs> many artificial limbs. You could control it once, like if you oh. really practice. Could you get? Could you get to the point where like you're, you know, Doctor Octopus with the eight? <laughs> that would be arms. really interesting to find out. What is the limit? Yeah, <laughs> what is like, the we're, limit? We're so used to like walking on two feet that we, oh, if I had to control four feet, but you don't really consciously think left, right, left, right as you walk, right? So nope. it just becomes. And I don't think that dogs and cats do that. So maybe you could get like a couple extra feet and legs and stuff, and it would just become comfortable after a while, and you could do that, but. My goodness, that'd be kind of fun to try. I'd love to. So, if anyone has a brain two robot system that they want to <laughs> let me, let me and Justin borrow, we want to play with it a little bit. We have a phone interview coming right up, so we are going to go to our break, and we'll be back in just a few moments with more this week in science. You want t-shirts? We got them. You want music? Got that too. The This Week in Science World Robot Domination t-shirts and the 2007 Science Music Compilation CD are now available. Go to www.twis.org for more information. We want the money. Yep, This Week in Science is looking for sponsors and advertisers. If you're trying to reach a new audience, sell a product, or support a good cause, Contact me, Kirsten, at thisweekinscience.com for information.
we're back. We have Dr. Donald Procero on the line. He's written a book called Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters. He is a paleontologist and professor of geology at the Occidental College in Los Angeles, and he's a lecturer in geobiology at the California Institute of Te Technology in Pasadena. He's also on the editorial board of Skeptic Magazine. He's written so many scientific papers, I just can't even count them all on two hands. Without any further ado, let's bring him on the line. Welcome to This Week in Science. Hello. Hello. Hi. Can you hear us? Yeah, just fine. Excellent. It's wonderful to have you on the air this morning. Um, something that has come up again and again in, in our program over the years is is just the question of uh, evolution and how it works and the evidence for it and um, and and there is a lot of debate that personally I don't think is a warranted debate as to um, the accuracy as as to as to what ev whether or not av evolution actually happens um, and you've written a great book here that really gets to the nut of how evolution occurs according to scientific evidence. And can you tell me a little bit about what brought you to the point of writing this, this text? Yes, uh, I've been actually involved in the creation evolution debate uh, for much of my career, ever since I became a paleontologist. And I, when I was first in my first teaching job in Illinois, I actually taught courses on creationism and evolution and debated the number one uh, guy in the uh, creationist uh, agenda, Mr. Uh, Dr. Phil, uh, Dr. Uh, Gish. And so I got so I got to know their arguments pretty well. And uh, about two years ago, when I was talking to my publisher about an idea for a book, I'd just given a talk on this topic, and I realized, you know, there are a lot of other books out there that talk about the biological side of evolution or the political, philosophical side of evolution, but none of my colleagues in paleontology had set, uh, set about to write a, uh, um, a book that really showed how much we've learned in the fossil record, and that was my focus. How was how did those debates go? By the way, because I mean, it, it seems like I would be pretty much just I'd be on the stage with in the debate and just be like, okay, men have nipples, yeah, whales well, have toes. What be what do you need? How that doesn't impress anybody who's already a <laughs> fundamentalist. Wow. Um, I did this one against Dwayne Gish in 1983 at Purdue University, and I beat him pretty badly, according to everyone who was there as a witness, and I have tapes to prove it. But the the basic idea is that he was a machine, as he always is. Uh, he you know, gives the same sequence of slides in the same order all the time. He completely ignores his opponent and never answers or acknowledges him. Hmm. And so I had in this particular format a first and third half hour, the first two hours of four-hour debate. Wow. And so wow. I uh, knew exactly what he was going to say before he said it, and I pretty much debunked his arguments before he got to them. Ah. Oh, that's nice. and, and I even stole a couple of his jokes. <laughs> and, he didn't, and he didn't change a thing. Uh, his slides were the same. His patter was the same. Even the jokes, which made no sense when I said them, of course, uh, sounded very strange when he said them after I'd already stolen them. Wow. Uh, but the point <laughs> is, his audience doesn't get it. I mean, the audience, you know, you just discredit his argument as clearly as you can, and his audience, who are fundamentalists, don't understand what, he's, what they're talking about. He just gives them a simplified version that they can get, get around, and, of course, they come in that, that room already, pretty much pre-sold on a fundamentalist agenda, and they won't want to listen to evolution at all. And the, the bigger problem was they held this on a Saturday night on a big college campus like Purdue, charged a lot of money for it, which meant the only people who showed up for that debate were people busted from all the surrounding churches. Hmm. And I pretty much had a 95% hostile audience when I got up there. Wow. Now, most Purdue students have better things to do with their time and money on a Saturday night. So. <laughs> Unless they're very dedicated to this issue, which there are not that many who were. So also, I think I think especially on a college campus, if you, there was a debate about creationism versus evolution, you would assume that it was put on purely by the creationists. Cause oh, it always there's is, no yeah. but there's no debate. Like, what are you talking right. about? Well, and that is, and then and generally the rule of thumb is you don't bother with debating these guys. It's a waste of time. It gives them legitimacy they do not deserve. Uh, it makes them sound like they are your peers when they're not, because these guys are not legitimate scientists. They don't practice the rules of science. Um, and so most of the time I've not, you know, I've been invited to do it many times. This is the only time I made exception, and I really did it just from my own experience, just to say I'd done it once, you know, and prepare myself and to get to know the, the ins and outs, the arguments, and mm -hmm. to say, you know, I beat this guy, and I did. And I never took up another chance to do it because it was pointless repeating it once you've done it. Yeah. And likewise, I, you know, I get invitations all the time to, to go on these things. And I did one TV panel here in Los Angeles a couple of years ago, 
but most of the time it's it's very frustrating because you never you're never going to win these debates. You just can push them to a draw basically because the audience is already pre-sold against you because their arguments are, are you know easier to to uh, mis distort in 30 seconds than they are to explain in 30 minutes, and that's the way they work. The Gish and all the rest of them they do what they call the Gish gallop, which is they jump from astronomy to anthropology to paleontology to thermodynamics. You know they run all over the gamut of science topics. They throw out one mistaken and distorted idea, and they race to something else. And when it's your turn, you have to spend twice as long as they did just to get the da- damage undone and explain the concept correctly. Right. And, and the audience usually has completely forgotten what was said in the first place. Mm-hmm. Right. And, so and, and you and never win in that context. Yeah, and oftentimes it's, uh, it's, it's, it just seems like that a lot of examples are put out there to confuse people because right. the majority of people don't have the scientific experience to really evaluate the evidence right. that's they been They sound given convincing to, them. to someone who doesn't know anything about science, and yeah. that's all they depend on. So they're, they're one of their most famous examples is routinely distorting the second law of thermodynamics and yeah. claiming the world is running down and that cannot happen and allow evolution to occur. Well, that's not what the second law well, says. See, that's so where I would go the opposite direction, and I would start quoting creationism. <laughs> See, if there was Adam but no Eve, and then they right, decided right. they needed a woman, well, Adam not only didn't have nipples, right. he was also missing something else that would have been right. required for later that's procreation. Right. Well, and see, that's the problem, though, because in that format, <laughs> and this happens to just about everyone, they always take an aggressive stance, and they virtually never defend their own position. That's a standard technique they do. They're not allowed, to pretty much by their debating rules, to actually step back and defend what they say, because then they would sound ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And so in a debate format where they can shift and they can focus on what they want to focus on, they try to keep them on the, you or you on the defensive, they stay in the offensive, and it's very hard to shift them the other way. Uh, when they're in court, which happened back in 82 when they were in the federal court decision in Arkansas that, that struck down the young earth creationist attempts, and then just recently in the Dover trial that they're now going to have a, a PBS thing on tonight, as a mm-hmm. matter of fact, in both cases in court you can't make speeches and you can't uh, avoid a direct question. If a judge says you've got to answer a direct mm-hmm. question, you've got to answer it. And that's why they get demolished, because as soon right. as they're actually pinned down, and, you know, or if you're in written forms, you actually, you know, quote them directly from what they actually say, then their ridiculous uh, ideas show up as what they are. Yeah. One question is, you know, there, there are the people that we cannot convince, because right. they've already and made Maybe their... 40% of the country, actually. Yeah. It could be quite a lot. <laughs> Some polls say that, so... Which is kind of scary, but... Very scary, yes. But in terms of other people, there are, then there are you know the ten twenty percent who are you know pretty scientifically convinced. They study science. They're you know interested in in this topic. And then there's the rest who are unconvinced by either side. They don't really understand the science. But the media is putting this out as an actual debate. When inside the scientific community, there is no debate as to whether or not evolution happens. That's right. The only people who have this agenda behind them are people who are from the extreme right wing. Uh, you know, uh, religious fundamentalism, you know, people who want to push their narrow view of God on the rest of the country, and that, of course, is a violation of the First Amendment. Uh, so those are the people we're dealing with. And the problem you have is that the way they play the game is that uh, they try to play to the Christian sympathies of the majority of our country by saying anyone who doesn't agree with them is an atheist. Right. And so the only <laughs> people actually who are effective against them in debate format are actually people who are good Christian scientists who cannot be called atheists, and then their main, main lever against their opponent is lost. But uh, overall, the bigger problem is that they play, paint the world in black and white terms. You know, you're either a fundamentalist like us, or you're an atheist, and you're going to hell. Well, what if and, you're a devout atheist? <laughs> well, I mean... Uh, if you actually believe that God is an atheist, and yeah, therefore right. you're so actually that, practicing a religion. That's a, such a small minority, I don't think we have to worry about them in this context. <laughs> but the context we're talking about here is, is getting the American public to at least be a little more science literate, even yeah. if it does you know, require these uh, you know, big battles we're fighting. And that's the bigger problem, is that the, so much of the American public, generally speaking, is scientifically illiterate, you know, from their limited high school science exposure and the fact that most of them don't have any more exposure, even if they go to college. Uh, that's the bigger issue, and that's the reason we are so pathetically behind. I mean, every poll that's ever been done, you know, comparing science literacy among westernized nations, uh, you know, Japan, uh, China, and most of the Western European countries are near the top, and U.S. is down at the very bottom of the list, along with Namibia and Yugos, the former Yugoslavian states and things like that. It's so pathetic compared to you know anything else that we should be doing, yeah. and given our science well, and technology really? edge at the higher levels. So, well, let's start. Let's start off with a little bit of education here. I think terminology is one of the things that that causes confusion in our country. Um, so, what is a theory? 
Uh, yes, that's the first issue that has to be cleared up. The, there's two different words where it uses the word theory. Scientists use theory to, uh, rec- to describe an idea that's extremely well supported. It's been tested many times. Gravitation is a theory, okay? And nobody debates how, and we don't even understand how gravitation works, but it works, and nobody debates that it exists, okay? An evolutionary theory is the, the large body of, of evidence that we just use to describe and try to understand evolution. And yet, at this moment, we don't understand every detail how evolution works, and that's fine. Science is always going to be that way. It's always open-ended, but we still know that evolution occurs. We can watch it happen at every, every scale you can imagine, from fruit flies and jars to stuff going on in bacteria and viruses and our, our flu bugs to uh, stuff going on in nature, which is being documented all the time now. Right. And then we can watch it from a very much longer perspective in the fossil record, which is what I work on. So, and the bigger problem is that there's a different concept of science. You know, people get their concept of science from, you know, from uh, the, you know, the movies and TV with the mad scientists and the yeah. bubbling beakers and all the rest. But scientists are not about you know, what they wear. I mean, I don't wear a lab coat and I don't do any <laughs> of those other things. I don't usually have chem apparatus around me. Uh-huh. Scientists are defined by the way they work. And the basic principle of science is that science must be testable. Right. Your hypotheses must be capable of being proven false, or you're not performing science. And you must be always willing to reject and throw out your ideas and move on to new ones, which means science is always tentative. It's never about final truth. And that's something the public completely misunderstands. They think science is all about final truth. Well, scientists themselves know that's not the case. And uh, so you have this kind of uh, misconception that's built on this idea anytime uh, an evolutionist talks about something and they point out there's this discussion or debate or it's tentative, well, that's the way science is supposed to work. But to a creationist who believes in absolute certainty, this is a sign that we aren't doing our jobs, when in fact it's, it's, right. it's actually the way it should be. And so we got this complete basic mu- fundamental misconception about science that's at the root of a lot of this. And uh, that's the fundamental reason, of course, why creation in itself can never be science, because their conclusions are predetermined in advance. They will not change it no matter what the data says. Uh, they even sign a loyalty oath, if you remember the ICR down in San Diego, where you have to agree to certain conclusions and you have to uh, sign off on that, which no scientific uh, organization would ever insist upon because you know conclusions are never fixed. So that's, that's the clear, crystal clear different difference between scientists and creationists. Right. So th- that gets to another point of uh, the differences in terminology. So we have our, you know, the in science, the theory of evolution, which right. the which people who are and are not the, the, can't don't believe evolution, uh, they attack the word theory right. by using because the word theory has a different meaning in the lay public. It's a wild, harebrained scheme, like right. theories of why JFK was assassinated, that kind of thing. Right, and then but then scientists come back, and even though science is not something that's ever final, we come back to the public and say this is a fact. And right. we and we you we we change our terminology right. to communicate with the public, right. and so I think there that in itself you know creates confusion too. That is a problem. The fact, the reality is that scientific language is different from public language, and it always has been and probably always will be. And we, we're at a you know a situation where you know we have to we have to translate. So we say fact, even though in science we try to say something is never proven finally, but in the public parlance, something that we you know. The, Earth goes around the sun is a fact in every public sense of the word, even though it's still a hypothesis in a scientific term that's been extremely well corroborated. Right. And so that's the problem. We're jumping from a scientific, philosophical set of words to the way the public understands it, and there are two different terms, and oftentimes, like the word theory, used two different ways. So creationists take advantage of the public conception to attack it the way scientists use it. So. There was a, uh, a, a question that was brought up in a at a conference for science writers that I attended recently where we were talking about the problem with language in terms of communicating uh, controversial subjects to the public. And right. the, the question was raised as to whether or not we should stop calling it the theory of evolution and whether or not we could convince scientists, as I'm saying this in a general we, right. but um, whether or not we could start saying law and change it, change, stop calling it a theory, and yeah, call it the well, law yeah, of evolution, or the fact of evolution. Of entrenched scientific philosophy yeah. and things like that already. <laughs> and those, those terms of scientists have used those that way for a very long time. Yeah. And we clearly understand what they mean, and we have no controversy within our profession as to what is intended. And so I, we recognize, I am sure, that it, it is a problem because the public doesn't see it that way, but it doesn't help us a lot. I don't, you know... Because, you know, it's still going to be a semantic game. They're still going to attack you in the same way they've always attacked you. And even if it's not the word theory, there's so many other ways they come at you, you know, with one you know, attack after another that, you know, it's, it, that's only a small part of the 
issue. I mean, yes, it'd be nice if we could communicate in such a way that people didn't doubt us because of the words we use, but uh, we're, we're talking about a bigger issue, one of credibility of people who are not scientists who pretend to be scientists. Well, I, I think, you know, we should remain in the ivory tower on this issue completely <laughs> and just, no, and just laugh. And just, if you're ever on one of those shows again, don't worry so much about defending evolution, but just laugh at the ridiculousness well, of the opponent. Well, I try when I get the chance. I mean, <laughs> in a format where you're allowed to attack them or where they're forced to answer, you can put them at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And even in a, in a debate format, I did the best I could by going over his arguments before he got to them and showing how ridiculous they were. But, of course, they're, they're so much blinded by their narrow view of the world. They only hear and they only see what they want to hear and see. So no matter how many times you point out they're wrong, they don't get it, or they don't want to get it. You know, it's a very much typical American psychology issue where people who just have one narrow point of the world and nothing else around them will impact them because they simply don't see what they want to hear. You know, just like we have the balkanization of media now, where mm. you want to hear about the, the Bush successes in Iraq, <laughs> you watch Fox News, and the rest mm. of the media don't matter because the people who only want to hear one point of view can find a point of view that, that basically distorts the world to favor them. It's extremely so. dangerous. Absolutely. So let's get to uh, some of the actual fossil evidence that you talk about in, in your book and that you've been studying throughout your career. Um, one of the, one of the uh, arguments against evolution and using the fossil record as evidence for evolution is that we, we're missing right. lots of transitional species that should be there. So, right, so right. what's going on? Well, the basic argument is that the, one of the weakest spots for creationists is the fossil record. And they know that if they had a, you know, they, if the fossil record were shown to be convincingly against them, they would have their biggest problem defending it. And so they go about it pretty much in a systematic campaign of, of distortion and outright falsification and lying to deny what is apparently evidenced, uh, apparent to anyone who wants to look at it. And uh, so when you read what they write about the fossil record, the first thing you have to remember is they may flow, uh, throw a Ph.D. around on the cover of their book, but none of them have Ph.D.s in the relevant areas. They can't tell yeah. one bone from another. Not one of them is a legitimate paleontologist who works on the animals I'm talking about in this book. So there's no, they have no credibility in this. It's just the same as if they were talking about music theory or auto mechanics. You wouldn't listen to them because they don't have any fo formal training in the field to actually talk about it. When you read what they write about fossils, it's all... Quotes out of context from usually very old sources or very marginal sources, which don't prove anything. And usually, of course, they're out of context, which means there's, they aren't actually saying what they claim they say. So I go over that at great length in the book. But then the, the strength of what I'm trying to point out, and the book's latter half is all about this, is just how much we have, especially in the last 40, 50 years, and maybe especially the last 5 or 10 years, have an enormous increase in the quality of the fossil record. Now, it's never going to be complete, and we never pretended it was. But it has amazing sequences of transitional forms from many different things. And I have examples of how we can have uh, many fossils making the transition from, uh, from fish to amphibians and from uh, dinosaurs to birds and from you know, land animals to whales, all of which are extremely well documented. It's mostly in the last 10 years or so. And I've got specimens in there of uh, you know, a manatee with feet and hands and not flippers huh. and specimens of uh, things like there's a, a, a breakthrough in my book, a sort of a scoop. Uh, I've got a fossil of a giraffe with an intermediate length neck between a primitive giraffe and the modern giraffe. Nice. You know, so it's halfway to being long necked, and that was not yet formally published in the literature. But my friend, who's the author of that the specimen, is uh, getting it published right now. Uh, so it's just full, chock full of examples. And that's one of the things my publisher and my artist and I were trying real hard to do was to show as much as possible the actual physical evidence and not just talk about it, which is where the problem lies in communication often. But let people look for themselves. Yeah. So we have a 16-page you know, like color section in the middle, and I made a point of getting the very best, most beautiful specimens of fossils that you know they could not have any doubts are transitional forms, and show them the real fossil as it really looks, you know, and uh, and uh, not just a cartoon or a restoration, so people can see these things are not made up. Cause that's a that's an issue of credibility now. Enough people have been listening to creations long enough now that they don't. Some of these people don't believe this stuff exists, and they think it's all hoaxes. You know, it's scary. It's as scary as the. You know, the flat earth creationists, and that's a legitimate movement out there, by the way, the flat earth creationists who are convinced because of their literal beliefs in the Bible the earth is flat and everything NASA has shown us the hoax. You know, so there's that kind of level of scientific illiteracy going on here. So, How can somebody who is just in the general public, what is it, how, how can they know that your book is the, the better source than one, say, written by a, um, an anti-evolution 
group well, who, the, who number are... one reason is credibility. I mm-hmm. actually worked on these fossils. In most cases, I've described things I've actually physically seen uh, and worked with to some degree, and in quite a few cases, they're actually specimens I've studied and published on myself. And so I have the credibility because I have the credentials and because I've actually physically worked with them. And if you look closely at these creationists and the way they write, especially if you know something about it, you'll know right away they don't know what they're talking about. They have no formal training in this stuff. They don't know one bone from another. And they make mistakes that are ridiculously obvious to anyone who's actually a qualified paleontologist. And it's all because that's all they care about. They just want to find something, you know, distort it, and they don't have any incentive to actually learn about it. They just want to deny it. So one of the distortions that I hear uh, quite often is actually represented in the Creationist Museum. <laughs> Kirsten's showing me this picture of a fish with hands. It's a frogfish. Uh, it's so cute. Is, yeah, is, yeah is, I thought that was cute. Just to show how easy it is to make the transition to land, because ray fin fishes have done it multiple times as well as low fin fish. So. so in the Creationist Museum, what they'll show is dinosaurs and, and early man together. Right. All right. So... So it comes down to how we date things. Like, okay, you've got this fossil record, but a lot of stuff has died off in the last 2,000 years or whatever. Yeah. How ca- what is the method for actually dating, finding out how far back well, things I are mean, and there's, how reliable? There's something very simple there. You can look at the strata, for example, in a place like the Colorado Plateau, and the last dinosaur shows up at the top of the Cretaceous, and then we have thousands of feet of Cenozoic deposits sitting right on top of them, and no evidence of humans until the very, very end of those. Uh, that's physically separated by too much to be explained by any kind of Noah's Flood thing or anything else. It's not a made-up fantasy in the mind of geologists. And then if you want to actually get dates on it, we have many places on Earth where you can actually get volcanic ash layers or volcanic lava flows, which give us very reliable dates, usually by potassium argon dating, that tell us the youngest dinosaur is no older than, you know, no younger than 65 million and the oldest human, depending upon how you define them in Africa, are around six or seven million. So, I, yeah, and I think that's what's important to point out is that to to deny uh, evolution isn't just to say that the paleontologist is wrong, but it's also to say that uh, geologists right. have it all wrong, the, the climatologists have it all wrong, the chemists all the have it all wrong. Well, they have this weird model they call flood geology, where they try to squeeze the entire yeah. spectrum, of everything we know in the geologic sciences, into a silly little model of the Noah's flood. And I just actually gave a lecture on that on Sunday, which uh, debunked the whole topic. And <laughs> I think Chapter 3 in the book has got a short version of that in, the, in there. But um, the, the basic idea is that the, their attack is not just an evolution. That's just the, the most obvious target and the one that's the weakest in the public mind. They actually wanted to destroy all of geology, all of astronomy, all of anthropology, anything which goes against their literalist view of the first books of the Bible. And so it's really an attack on science in general, because they're in their world is trying to retreat to a world that goes back 2,000 years ago. And so you're really at a disadvantage if you try to deal with them, because they're actually, you know, they have a broader agenda. They just, they don't talk much about their other ones until they get an audience that's more sympathetic. But, I mean, for example, if they were capable of actually doing real geology, and if they actually did geology in the real world, we'd have no oil or gas or coal. Because you can't find oil, or gas, or coal if you're a creationist. They don't have the models that would actually explain how it's formed and where it's found. And we would be sitting here with much higher gas prices right now than we have. And there's a lot of practical problems to their attack right. on science that come from not just you know attacking a part of biology that's central, but you know it's a fundamental attack on all aspects of science, including some that are economically very important to us. Okay, we have to finish up our interview here. Unfortunately, this is so much fun to talk to you. But I have you. one last question. What is sure. What is your favorite fossil that you've ever worked on? Uh, oh, I've worked on a lot of them, but uh, fossil rhinos are actually the group I've worked on the most for the last 20 years or so. So I've got a whole series of specimens of rhinos I've worked on in detail, and I published a book in 2005 on all the evolution of North American rhinos. So I guess you could say it's that. Uh, a friend of mine actually named a fossil rhino fairly recently out of Oregon uh, after me, so I've got my first animal. Oh, name that's after. awesome. Yay. So you, know, you can't do it for yourself. You have to have a friend do it for you. Oh, is that right? Yeah, the laws of the, you the law are that. you cannot actually name an animal after yourself. Wow. So it's always had to be just done as a tribute by somebody else. Because I, yeah, I was actually wondering that because there was a beetle that they found a while ago that hadn't didn't hadn't been given a scientific name yet, right. and I'm like, how does that happen? I would just call it Justinicus beetlefus, right? right? As, well, as soon as I discovered lots it. Lots of beetles have not been named. <laughs> There's thousands of them out there that haven't been, uh, but the rules are very strict. And one of the things you cannot do is name something after yourself, hmm. and you have to justify where you got the name from. Uh, but it's common in science, you know, if someone respects you, they often name things after you, especially I spent 20 years working on rhinos. So someone who got a name in a rhino was decided to name it after me, which was a very nice 
Nice that's, honor. That's so. neat. Congratulations. So did you hear that, Minions listening in the audience, if you're discovering <laughs> new Beatles and stuff? Yeah. Just keep no, me in I mean, mind, you, wanna, you know? want to get into systematic <laughs> biology, there's a lot of room to name, name a lot of animals. Just have to... I'll like, even take a bacteria. I don't... Yeah. I want something. Yeah. It's just eight, six or eight years of PhD program and a, yeah. a lot of postdoc research. That's all it takes. That's no. all. <laughs> well, only a little bit of hard work. <laughs> a lot of grant money, too, unfortunately. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. You're welcome. It's been fascinating talking with you. I hope that this uh, conversation extends to our listeners and that the debate goes forward and, okay, and moves thank on. Okay, thank you very much. And thank the you book, very much. The book is... Tonight if you want to watch about the Dover trial. So. One, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank the book you. is Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters. Okay, this is Dr. Thank Donald much. Prothero. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. And that's about it for us at Twists. We've got a, uh, a couple of comments from listeners uh, Brandon Wilhelmson, a uh, twist minion, wrote in to say that he wanted to mention that Mike Huckabee took the same quiz that you took, Justin, mm. and was told that he should vote for Mitt Romney <laughs> and that he agreed with his own platform 71% of the time. Oh, wow. Let's stick to making <laughs> our own minds up, he says. <laughs> and then Jake Hartman, a research analyst, wrote in to say, having listened to the calm, the claim on this show this week, which you were rightly skeptical about, that alcohol had caused more deaths than all the wars together. I thought I'd do a bit of research. Beginning with the Revolutionary uh -huh. War, there have been about 1,542,897 U.S. deaths attributed to war, counting the most up-to-date numbers in Iraq right now. In 2005, the number of deaths attributed to drunk driving was only 16,855, according to the CDC. The only way that deaths Attributed to drunk driving could be as high as U.S. war casualties would be if this rate was held for the last 100 years, which obviously it hasn't given that cars 100 years ago weren't exactly what they are today, not to mention the fact that the population has grown dramatically. So all in all, the numbers are probably closer than they should be, but wars win out, mostly because they've wait, been wait. around longer. Did they start Love with the, the Civil show, War? Keep up the good work. There were no cars! <laughs> How you can't start with the Civil War? There were no cars! What, drunken cart? Did they keep, keep records on drunken cart accidents? Because if so, I bet a lot of people <laughs> fell off the wagon. And that's where getting on the wagon, off the wagon even came from. It's probably because people had wagon accidents when right. they were drunk. If you learn anything from today's show, remember. It is all in your head. Thanks once again to AudibleKids.com for supporting this hour of This Week in Science. Brilliant. So glad they thought of it. Brilliant. <laughs>